Okay, ranking of holidays, go. Oh, man. Okay. Uh, number one, Thanksgiving. Number two, Whoa. Uh, maybe Halloween. Number three, Flag Day. Big fan <laughs> of Flag Day. Wow. Number four, uh, Christmas, maybe. I don't know. Damn. Christmas is, Christmas is, I have different feelings about Christmas as an adult with the kids than I did it as a kid. Yeah, that's uh, fair. Uh, and then all the way at the bottom of the list is 4th of July. Okay. Wow. What? Because fuck fireworks, man. Oh, sure. Especially if you've got dogs, I guess, and stuff. Or children, or, or just don't want, live in a state that you don't want to burn down. It mm-hmm. turns out. Mm-hmm. What, 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 what's your, give me your list. So I, okay. I was just thinking of the, the three year enders. Oh, Christmas, New Year's and Thanksgiving. Yeah. Yeah. We just get a good monthly cadence. Just a boom, boom, boom. I do like the boom, boom, boom. I'm going to say of the three, Thanksgiving is a dead last for me. What? Which is not not to knock Thanksgiving. I certainly I love Thanksgiving. Wow. But it's primarily a food holiday. Is this because we don't do the big thing anymore? Do you not? Not really. You're not doing it anymore. The, pa- the pandemic kind of finished it. I didn't want to ask. I didn't want I wasn't going no, to ask. I, I was I, just like, look, you know, I'm not going to invite myself. If he if he asks, then I'll say, yeah, I'd love to come. Look, we were going to. And then just the amount of the amount of it's it's there's a lot of work for the food, but then there's more work that's like getting the house ready to have people over. Yeah. And if it was just the food, I think we'd be fine. But the getting the house ready to have people over is just a lot. Yes, and that's yeah, that is for sure. That's for sure. I don't know. I'm I'm in a weird headspace because I feel like it, Halloween was yesterday. Like I'm still kind of thinking spooky stuff. Yeah, we just took our Halloween decorations down like five days ago, I think. Uh, but then we went to Trader Joe's today, and between that and watching some network television the other night, it's extremely basically like Christmas next week now. Well, I mean, Gina went to Target the other day and came back with a bunch of Christmas stuff, and I was like, "Why the hell did you buy?" It's not even Thanksgiving. She's like, "Look, if I don't buy it now, it'll be gone by the time I need it." Yeah. And I was like, what? So what? I'm going to go out the day after Thanksgiving and they're going to have Valentine's Day stuff there. She said pretty much. So like I, I just bought a couple of bottles of some like spiced Christmas ale. Yeah. Not two hours ago. Did you get the uh, you get the you get that Anchor Steam annual Christmas release. No, Anchor Steam's done, man. But there's no Anchor Steam anymore. Oh, you didn't hear? I don't really drink beer anymore. I don't I don't know what this cold open is, but yes, Anchor Steam has ceased to exist. Oh, man, I'm super sad now. Yeah, I know, right? It's like, wasn't it? I think it was the oldest brewery. It was the in, oldest craft brewery in the United States. Yeah. yeah, I think Sapporo bought them some years ago, and then I don't know what happened, but they killed them off like three, four months ago. God, that's awful. Yeah, it's pretty sad if you have lived in San Francisco. I've never went. I never went to their brewery. God damn it. I lived here for 20 years, and I never went to that brewery. Okay. I you want the truth or do you want me to make this easier for you? Uh, I give, give it to me straight. The brewery tour is freaking awesome. You should have totally gone. <sighs> Man. Uh, you got to see all the open brewing vats and the whole thing. It was really cool. And then they got to taste in the, in the brewing room, the tasting room afterwards. Well, my family lives uncomfortably close to what is now Sierra Nevada's East coast base of operations. Mm, yeah. And they have a brewery tour, so I can, you should do that. I could go see some beer uh, I, anyway. I, yeah. You know, Thanksgiving. It's, it's a great number three. I'm personally offended by this ranking already. It's just an afternoon of decadent indulgence. Yeah. All those pies I uh, made. Yeah. Years and years of pies. <sighs> okay. What's number two? I think Halloween now. Hold on. But what, what are the three banger list and a year list? I thought you were just doing three. It's, it's, this is the, the three is what I'm saying. I'm oh, saying yours is Hall- oh, I thought you were going to say Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's, not Halloween, uh, Thanksgiving, oh, New Christmas. Year's Does New Year's even count? I mean, I don't know, but Ryan, what was it Ryan used to say about New Year's and St. Patrick's Day? It's like amateur hour for people who have <laughs> drinking problems. Uh. Welcome to Brad and Will Made a Tech Pod. I'm Will. I'm Brad. Hi. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hello. Uh, this is the, as it is the week before Thanksgiving. Uh, well, okay. So full disclosure, we were going to do a Steam Deck episode this week, uh, mm. but FedEx ate the Steam Deck along the way somewhere between. Was it, was it FedEx? Uh, it's it's was unclear. It definitively FedEx or nobody just, knows? I, look, I'm throwing shade at FedEx. I don't know. Mm. The it, 
anyway, the Steam Deck didn't get here in time to do the show about it this week. It's going to arrive tomorrow morning, it looks like. Your Steam Deck OLED just walked away, huh? It's, it's, I'm somebody along the chain, got a Steam Deck OLED, and I'm happy for them. Or it's sitting like under a desk somewhere in Seattle. But needless to say, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. uh, we are, uh, so we'll do a Steam Deck episode next week, I think, is the thought. Uh, the, if you want to, if you want some steam deck info in the meantime, check the gamers nexus steam deck teardown where they took both the old steam deck and the new steam deck and took them apart side by side to show you exactly what's changed. And That's there's cool. more to it than what Val was talking about, which is cool. Interesting. Uh, but so this week we're going to do our legally mandated technologies. We are thankful for yeah. episode. Yes. This is our, um, I believe fourth Thanksgiving. Yeah. This, this is, is our, fourth our fourth Thanksgiving as a podcast. I don't know that we've done four texts we're thankful for. I'm not sure we have. I could either, have looked, but, but yeah, look, they're looked on our duty. So, so the idea here is here are the things they're not big enough to be a whole episode. They're, they're like things that have made our lives better in some important way, mm -hmm. like, or, or minor way in some cases. Yeah. And, and like, I think all of this starts with nanotape. That's, that was one of the first ones that we talked <laughs> yes. about in this context. Yes. Nanotape is just like the prototypical tech pod product in, in every context. Well, so but yes. Okay. For people who don't new newcomers to the show, nanotape is like is tape with little microscopic bubbles on it, yeah. yes. and it basically affixes to smooth surfaces. Uh, you don't want to put it on drywall because it'll rip your drywall off if your if your walls are real smooth. Yes. Um, but like I use it to hold down all the stuff on my desk in a non permanent way, so that like when I press a button on a stream deck or move my mouse wrist rest or move my headphone volume knob duber, it doesn't slide around the desk. It makes yes. my it, it makes me very happy. Yes. Keep, keep some nanotape around. The brand does not matter. No, that's just that's, the other. That's the other question that comes up from people who hear us talk about it more recently is like, Hey, which one should I get? I, I couldn't even tell you the name of whatever one we have. It's just, I, I just buy the cheap one on Amazon. I don't yeah. buy the alien, the, the alien brand stuff that does the advertising on TV is like three prices compared to the cheap stuff. So yeah. yes. I, also it's reusable. Like it's not like it's permanent. There's no adhesive. So you can mm -hmm. peel a piece off and use it again on something else later. Yeah. If, you, if you're so inclined to do yes. and it's cheap. Yes. Just but, don't use it on your PlayStation five stand. Why? What happened to your PlayStation 5 stand? It became very difficult to remove. Oh, no. And uh, something. I, I was I was a bit careless. I was trying uh -oh. to pull the stand off. And I was a bit careless as to which part of the stand I was holding on when, as I pulled it. And that's how my stand got broken. Uh, I'm having can't... thunder and lightning. Wow. That doesn't uh, happen here. Are you thankful for... I, thund I'm thunderstorms? I'm wondering about the surge protector situation under my desk because I don't think... I mean, I, you know, I could say right now, should I just kick this off? I'm thankful for some good surge protectors. I finally, I find, I tossed the, I, what, what turned out to be nine year old mono price, no name surge protectors recently that I was using for kind of everything. Those aren't going to do what you want, Brad. Uh, they were, they were, I bought them in 2014. They were mono price. I don't think they were anyway. I bought some, I bought some nice, relatively expensive trip light. I mean, they're 40 bucks. Yeah. which 40 bucks is like maybe 45 is a little high for a surge protector. But like <laughs> I thought about it, it was when I bought that new TV. Yeah. I bought the new TV and I've got a PlayStation five and an Xbox and a bunch of other stuff in there. You've got $2,000 worth of hardware plugged into your TV and you had a $9 surge protector from 25 years ago plugged into it. Anyway, anyway, I'm, I'm thankful for prioritizing like some things that should be prioritized, even if they're mundane and not actually like, sexy or interesting or exciting you know it's like nobody likes nobody gets excited about surge protectors but you should have probably good surge protectors I, there's a couple of places in my house like the surge protector behind my tv is old at this point yeah but it, it, it's like the tv also is old so when i replace the tv i'll replace the surge protector That's i fair. should probably get a better surge protector for the for my computer yeah just because it's it's uh you know it's getting up there yeah, the the they, not not to not to like push trip light. That's just the ones I happen to look at because that's what some places recommended. But they have yeah. models that, ironically, the higher dollar models literally just stop working when the surge protection is no longer in place. Like they basically just are done. Yeah, uh, the one I got is not that hardcore, but it does have, like there's a big a big obvious light that stops lighting up when the surge protection is no longer in effect. Because the, the the thing that makes the surge protection work stops being effective after a yeah. certain amount of current runs through it. Basically, yeah, it's, it's got a it's got a yeah. capacity that runs that, that runs out as it as it absorbs energy. Um, so, anyway, so on the power strip front, 
Um, I actually have one here. The I I really like uh Anker these Anker power strips that have like two or three uh 120 volt plugs on them, but then also three two or three USB ports that are with a high wattage charger. So you could get them anywhere from 20 to 65 watts. I think uh, the price goes up the higher the wattage. Like if you're the 65 watts are mainly for people plugging laptops in, but I put them, I put the cheap to the $20, 20 or 30 watt charger ones next to the chair and the sofa in the living room. So I can plug my phone in when I'm sitting there and like some, and I need, I need power, either extra power for the steam deck or the iPad or whatever it happens to be using this is sitting there using, um, it's a really nice quality of life thing. And it's also great for when I'm traveling because I plug those into the wall and then I get the plugs that I need next to the bed on the nightstand, even if the hotel or Airbnb or whatever has shit plugs and no, no place to charge your stuff on the nightstand. So, uh, and the, the, the one that I like is an Anker power cube with a 30 watt charger. That sounds useful. Speaking of power, I don't have this yet. I have resolved to get a pine power. Remember I pine can- power. Yeah, the, it's a it's like a power bank USB uh, uh, charger that has displays that tells you how much yes. the power the stuff is using. Oh, it looks so awesome! It looks all industrial. It's just got well, the little little like seven segment display numbers on it to show what the voltage is coming out of each USB port. It's made by Pine sixty four. We did the Fospod. Yeah, we talked about uh, the with, Pine Solo as well. Uh, Lukash uh, from Pine sixty four a few months ago. Yep. Um, I was going to order it. It's it's like four USB A and one USB C, and the USB C is sixty five watts, which is it should be fine for my my MacBook Pro. Like that MacBook Pro comes with a ninety six watt charger, I want to say, but mm-hmm. like I think sixty five is probably fine. Like that's a that that's only going to matter if you're like running at a hundred percent load for long periods of time, right? Y- yeah, like if you're using the thing normally and not if you're not using it for like sixty four hours straight or something you're pumping more energy in than it's using on the moment to moment. So it'll probably like it's, it's, it's a calculus problem at that point, right? It's all about rates in and rates out and all that. So yeah, I think the 65 watt port will be just fine for my laptop, but so I've, I've got a Mac, I've got the MacBook charger and an Anker like little wireless phone charging stand right here. And the pine power has got a wireless phone charging pad on the top of it. Oh, that's nice. So I'm going to declutter the desk with one tiny box that charges my laptop and some other USB stuff and an iPhone on top all in, little four by four brick. I hope to be thankful for that thing soon. Their shipping times say up to 45 days. I'm literally going to be out of town before <laughs> that thing would get here. So I'm going to order it after a year. Uh, I mean, speaking of charging stuff, uh, I really love it's the year of USB-C. I yeah. think this year. Yes, yes, yes. You're, you are absolutely right. I don't know what happened. I feel like I just turned around one day and everything was USB-C. Like lightning's gone. I have yeah. a phone that has USB-C now. Mm-hmm. My iPad's USB-C. My laptop's USB-C. Everything that I use, yep. all my controllers are USB-C. I, I haven't used a micro USB plug in probably six months at this point. It feels really good. Yes, yes. I, I, get, yeah, I guess it's been building for like three or four years now. Like I think it was the it was the PS5 and Series X coming out and both of those controllers being USB-C. Was the, that, was, that was the big eye-opening moment of like, oh, I guess we're actually doing this now. But I think the... The thing that made me realize, oh, USB-C is just here, it's done, like that whole thing happened, is like every little cheap device I'm buying now that comes with a USB cable, it's Mm -hmm. USB-C. Nobody is shipping non-C anything at this point. Yep. Uh, Also, on the power front, I... I, I can't overemphasize how much I love the MagSafe stuff on the newer iPhones. The it's a it's basically a magnetic ring. So it's like a it's like a Qi charger with a magnetic ring that snaps it into the right spot. So you like right. remember the early the early pads, you'd put your th- your phone down, you wouldn't get it in the right spot and it wouldn't charge that night. You wake up the next morning, you have a dead phone or a mostly dead phone. Uh with the with the MagSafe stuff, it just snaps into place, just like the old MagSafe ports on your laptop or the new MagSafe ports on your newer laptops too. Uh and in addition to like the MagSafe charger, the the mounts for your car or your desk or whatever that kind of set it up on a stand. They also they're also like third party accessories. So Anker, my my fan fanboyness over weird Anker stuff is done after this one, I promise. But Anker makes a ring. It's like a pop socket style phone grip that has a little pop out ring and it fits onto the MagSafe. So I can I can have my no uh, I can have my no case phone, but still have a nice way to hold on to it without having to grip it, death grip it uh, the whole time. 
uh, and and that clips on with the MagSafe. That thing's called the magnetic uh, Anker magnetic phone grip, uh, and it comes in colors to match your phone. So that sounds nice. That actually that makes me realize that Pine Power's iPad or the wireless charging pad is not going to have anything like that. And now I'm like, hmm, hmm. No, no. Does your um does your but I mean if it's a, if it's a stand or a flat thing that's rectangular, it was just the round ones that were hard. Like okay. Those, those first gen round pads, I always, I would miss a lot. Yeah. This, this is flat and it is square. Yeah. Like it, I'm sure it's fine. Easy enough to line up. I mean, you know, the worst, well, I guess, I guess the worst case, like you said, is you had get no charge, but I mean, short of that, the worst that happens is your phone is a little warm because you didn't get ideal charge and some of, that, missed, yeah. some of that, some of that electricity dissipated as heat instead. Yeah. Yeah. The, the nice thing about the MagSafe is because the ring p- positions the pad precisely where it needs to be, it works a little bit better through the, through the cases. So you don't, you don't waste as much energy tra- tra- traversing the what millimeter, two millimeters of the case thickness or whatever. Yeah. Um, this, I, this is a broad and somewhat ill-defined category. I've written it down in the notes here as modular computer stuff. Yeah. Um, I changed machines. I'm on this Intel machine now, mm-hmm. which meant, you know, moving a bunch of hardware around and then also wiping a drive and reinstalling. Actually, I didn't wipe the drive at first. At first, I booted up that amd fied Windows install on this oh Intel machine. Oh, my God, Brad. How'd that <laughs> just, go? Just to see what would happen. It was a bit of a mess. So you have to delete everything from device manager. You have to show all the hidden devices and delete everything oh, from device manager. I didn't and consider then, that. Theoretically, it'll just work. I figured it would be more graceful than that. I figured it would just work anyway because it would just see that those devices were no longer present and stop trying to do anything with them. So it it does, but they look. The better option is to back that thing up, wipe it, and, then, oh, yeah. and reinstall. That was that was always the goal, but I was more just an experiment to see how it would go. But boy, it was janky. Do, do you have an NVMe to SSD to SATA to USB adapter rather? No. So I that kind of ties into what I'm talking about here, and I should get one of those. Like I've, I'm still I've got old SATA. Um, um, oh, you're talking about for the Windows drive. You're talking about the actual system drive. Yeah, so you can so you can put the Windows drive in without having to boot off of it uh, um, and back it up using another computer. No, I probably should do that. I just imaged it to an external drive. Well, that works um, too. Well, that kind of goes to what I'm talking about here. There's just so much stuff out there, like, and it's usually pretty inexpensive. Or in some cases, we're talking about software. Like, there's so much stuff for getting data off of things, backing things up, storing things externally. Like changing machines is so much less painful than it used to be. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, I, I have a bin of just like, uh, it's like a USB to SATA adapter. There's yes, a the, parallel yes. ATA to, to to USB adapter. Oh, I, I still need to get one of those for the old hard drives at my parents' house that I'm afraid to try to spin up. Uh, the NVMe to USB adapter was like $15 and okay, has, I have to has saved my ass a couple of times. Yeah. So I need to, that, that absolutely needs to go into this kit of stuff that I'm talking about. So I, I've got like an, like a SATA, like a one terabyte SATA drive that I used to use in a machine, but now I have a $10 USB three to SATA cable. Now yep. that thing is a great external backup target, you know, yep. stuff like that just did not exist even 10, maybe, maybe 10 years ago. It stuff existed. like that was starting yeah, it was to there. show up. It was more expensive. Yeah. But it's like everything is like pretty reliable and pretty inexpensive these days. Um, you know, obviously my NAS is a bit more elaborate, but a NAS could just be like a hard drive plugged into your router if you want. But having having all my files external to the PC was pretty nice. Yeah, it is. It turns out having your data stored someplace that's not on the machine means that when the machine is weird or janky, your problems are a lot uh, more minor. Like yeah. when, my, when I had to swap out my CPU earlier this year, uh, having all my stuff stored on the NAS meant I could just grab the old computer, plug it in. I was back up and working in no time. Totally. Like I, I worked off of my MacBook for like a good week as I've been swapping parts around and like reinstalling windows and stuff and like having everything external to the machine I'm actually working on has really proved its worth. Uh, and again, you don't need a, you don't need a full size tower NAS like I have necessarily to do this. You could get one external drive and plug it into something. Um, I'm doing like, do I've got Git repos for stuff like configuration files now that just get pulled down automatically? Oh, that's funny. Um, I've got a, another Git repo for theoretically like multiple things I may write in the future. Right now, it's just that it's just that little podcast utility that I did a few months ago, which is saving mm-hmm. me tons of time. But like having stuff like that external, you know, it's like I again, you can just switch to something else to work off of and just sync all that stuff and go. It's so nice. To, it's so nice to not be dependent on a on one machine. And feel like everything 
is going to fall apart if something happens to that one machine. I mean, it's nice to have a live copy on the one machine on your live main machine and then a backup someplace else too. Yeah. Like knowing your backed up is good. Yeah. And there are just so many, it just feels like there are so many tools for facilit- facilitating things like that these days. I mean, there's yeah. like, there's so many free applications out there for like, like, like wind merge. Have you used wind merge? Have we talked about that yeah, before? Wind merge like, is great. Wind merge Mobile. is a great way to diff directories. For example, if you're like, if you're trying to back a bunch of data up and you, and you're like, did that copy finish? Did it skip anything? Like, do I really want to make absolutely sure all these files got moved? Like it's very quick, quick, easy way to just compare directories and make sure everything is identical. I use FileBot for that, I think, but that's just because I had paid for a FileBot license because it was a good way to create the directory structure that Plex wants for ripped DVDs on your on your server. Sure. Um, and it, it was kind of expensive, but it it does pull metadata from like TV, DB and stuff like that to make sure it's all right and Plexy. Sure. Um, um, you know, there, there's everything, the search utility that we love. Uh, yeah. There's there are now. I think this started with Windurstat back in the day, but I feel like there are like half a dozen of those now. I still use Windurstat. Is there something better? Uh, I use Space Sniffer. I like that one pretty well. Uh, there's also WizTree. A lot of people like WizTree claims to be <laughs> the fastest one by a lot. Uh, what we're talking about is like a whole drive scanning utility that will visualize the layout of the data basically in kind of giant blocks put together. So you can see like, you know, basically the biggest block is the biggest directory in terms of the space it's using. Anyway, I know like you and I work at home. We work on our machines that are also kind of our personal and gaming machines. Like I'm sure this stuff is a little bit less crucial for people. You know, like I, I, I actually have to remind myself like a lot of people who listen to the show have a computer at home that they just play games on. And it's just like, well, if something happens to that, it's fine. I'll have to build something else and maybe sync some cloud saves again. You know, not everybody's computing stuff at home is as mission critical as ours. But like it's just it's nice how many tools there are for girding well, machines that are uh, it, that are mission critical it's it's funny because i was on the pc world podcast a couple of weeks ago with adam uh a friend of the show adam and and steve from gamers nexus and we were talking about this about what the difference like how you build a machine when it's just like your gaming machine for goofing around when you're at home at night versus when it's your gaming machine that you're goofing around at home at night but also like every day that you can't use it you're not making money uh, that that puts a different lens on things. Yes. And and the response I got to talking about that was a lot of people saying, hey, my computer is also the way I make money. And without that, I like I'm in the same boat as you are. And it yeah. was a, like it was like accountants and people who are like, like a lot of like independent contractor type type jobs where people are coming in and helping people with their businesses or doing bookkeeping or whatever. So I, yeah. I get it. Yeah, I got I got some like earlier this year, some 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 feedback it was just like, boy, you seem like you're putting an awful lot of thought into that build. But it's like that Skylake build that I used for seven years before this year, like I just bought it was a new egg bundle that I bought because it was on sale. You know, yeah, it was just like that's how much thought I put into the previous computer I had, because back then I didn't need to use that computer for much of anything that was important. It was just like, oh, there's a cheap bundle of a motherboard and RAM <laughs> CPU. It's like, sure, why not? It really, really scales, scales to your use case. So on the utility front, I have a new one that I've just started using the last couple of weeks that I really, really like a lot. I like utilities. Go on. Um, it's files for Windows. Okay. It's in the Microsoft store. It costs nine bucks. And it's a it's a replacement for file manager, basically. Really? So file, ex- file explorer. Or File Explorer, yeah. Sorry, File Manager is on a different OS. Um, but it's it's really customizable. It has good previews in for a lot of the different uh, file types that you'll use. Okay. And you can configure pretty much everything about it. It also has a decent zip client built in, unlike Windows, Windows. Um, but it, so you, like, you don't have like thumbnail problems and stuff like that, like you do in normal File Explorer. Uh, also, it seems much faster. And really? You can drag, you can make tabs and you can do the thing where you drag a thing from the te- one tab to the other and you don't have to hold it until it until it clicks in. It just works, hmm. which is nice. Hmm. I'm looking at screenshots of this right now. Maybe I should just pay the nine bucks. You can't you can't try this, right? There's no way to try it. I, I'm going to go and tell you when I first downloaded it, I fired it up and then it immediately crashed. And I was like, well, I just pissed away $9 <laughs> oh, great. and then it's been perfect since then. Okay. I, I have replaced the icon for file Explorer on my desktop with the uh, icon for fi- I mean, on my taskbar with the icon for files. It is now okay. in my fourth win key plus four spot to open up a file browser. I guess, I guess that's actually my, um, Oh, win key E also. Well, actually that's just file Explorer. I just file Explorer. So that, that wouldn't work for a third party one, but actually that goes to the 
the question I was about to ask, which was like, how tightly does this integrate with Windows? Because you don't normally see people trying to explain uh, replace File Explorer. Like, like, would like, I wonder if third party applications when they try to launch a path, will those still launch in, um, uh, um, in File Explorer? Like, there's no there's no way to like associate a a file path or a directory path with another app, right? So like open dialogues and stuff like that still use the traditional file explorer okay. UI or whichever one they've hooked up to in their, in their application. Um, it, the, the, the other, the things I do like, like it, um, it works better. It, you know how Microsoft has started putting OneDrive at the very top of the list mm-hmm. in file explorer on the, on the, on the shortcuts as, on the left as a recent windows 11 convert. I do. Yeah. It's terrible. Uh, you, you, it looks at all the things you have cloud drive apps installed for and puts them in their own little category. Uh, it does pull over your shortcuts, I think by default from file explorer. Okay. Um, but beyond that, the integration is just, it's the new, it's your, it's your tool for viewing files. I don't believe that there's a system level way for it to take over things like the file browsers inside apps and stuff like that. Yeah, that makes sense. I I guess I wouldn't expect that. Speaking of OneDrive floating to the top in current file what is this gallery business that i also can't get rid of uh i that i don't know about but i i have a co-pilot preview wow on mine now oh that you, came up the other day are you, are you in the insider ring no i think it just pushed out to every it pushed out to easy computers the other day interesting okay I don't um, have, i'm on I don't 23 h2 now I, I believe i am also on that now uh, so you you have Copilot as well. I haven't clicked it yet. Gallery, I think, is just there. Hey, we have a new Photos app that's better than the old Photos app, maybe. Yeah. Um, can we talk about charging ports on the front of your computer? Yes. Uh, this- my my new motherboard. I haven't tried it yet, but I, I think I think that Gigabyte board I was using had like a thirty watt connection to the front yeah, thirty USB-C. watts for chumps, Brad. <laughs> <laughs> the this this um this Asus I think is a sixty five watts now. Mine, I think, is a 60 watt quick charge four, but I'm not I didn't I didn't check that. Um, I can plug the Steam Deck in. I can plug a switch in. It charges both of them at full speed. You know, That's all I needed to know. If I had thought ahead, I could try this live. I believe if that thing is 65 watts on this on this thing, I think I could run my MacBook Pro off of that port. I could run my MacBook off of this other computer, to, yeah. which is an interesting prospect. Yeah, it's uh, it's like it's like a, the mothership uh, docking into the. It's like it's like mm-hmm. your your laptop is the is the little airplane docking into the mothership dirigible in a Crimson yes. Skies game. Yes, you you know that reminds me of something that I might be thankful for at some point in the future. Yes. I've not tried yet. I was talking to someone on the Next Lander Discord recently, and I think this has come up on the TechPod server wow. as well. I'm crossing the streams. Uh, look, credit where due. Uh, somebody was using an eGPU with a laptop successfully. I've done that like, before. Like, remember when that was sort of just like a pie in the sky idea when they first announced the possibility of using Thunderbolt like 15 years ago? I, I did that have, in 2016 because I bought a laptop okay. that could do that right. specifically for VR stuff. It seems like it's becoming more of a thing now. Yeah, um, it was it was underwhelming. Was it? OK. I mean, they, they did caution like, hey, don't necessarily expect to just buy a laptop and an external graphics card and that and have that be your only computer. Yeah, the USB like, ports have to be wired, right? Yeah. Um, and and also, the problem I had was that the laptop was still really insanely loud, even with all the GPU stuff turned off in it. So it sure. it, it, it like it wasn't like something I would I used it for demos, and that was pretty much it. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, maybe maybe it's still not quite there, but I mean, like it kind of goes back to the thing I was talking about earlier. There are just there are just more adapters and enclosures and options for using stuff than I have ever seen before. Like there are other PCI Express enclosures now. Mm-hmm. Like um, Elgato, I found an Elgato tutorial that they put up for a specific PCI Express enclosure they bought to turn. Uh, do you do you have the 4K60 Pro capture card? No, I have the Avermedia. Okay. Um, yeah, the, the, they have an they have an extra. So that was one of the things I tried to do with my old eGPU enclosure when I had a one slot system, and it wouldn't work because the eGPU enclosure has to recognize the device type. Yes. And it only recognized GPUs. So, 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 so this was like an official Elgato t- t- tutorial, and even still, they linked to the specific enclosure they tried, and they said, "Hey, this is the only one we've tested. We can't say that others and will work." But it was a nice, tiny little enclosure, and it was basically a way to turn the 4K60 Pro, which is a, their internal capture card, mm-hmm. into a little external capture box, uh, which I thought was very cool. Yeah, that that kind of stuff is neat. Um, just the fact that it works at all is yeah. is lovely. Um, can we talk about uh, open source software that gives you ridiculous control over the stuff in your computer? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's always I, good. 
I have been using uh, both fan control and open RGB to control the fan speeds and pump speed on the cooling in my computer since I built this last year. And then uh, open RGB to control the lighting. And uh, it's it's a lovely it's a lovely combo. Um, I have it set so that when the computer goes to sleep, it turns off open RGB and that turns everything off. And when it wakes up, it, it relaunches open RGB and that starts everything back up again. Fan control. Uh, gives you really, really precise control over fan curves that are even like they can even integrate, interact with each other in ways that are interesting. So, for example, when my uh, VRMs around the CPU vol voltage regulators around the CPU get to a certain temperature, even if the CPU fan isn't supposed to be spinning, the, the fans nearest aren't, aren't supposed to be spinning because of the temperature uh, that they normally work off of it can it can supplement the it can supplant that setting and crank up the crank up the fan so it cools off the vrms or the memory or whatever it's a it's a incredibly powerful piece of software that's very um, cool and uh and then there's another thing called artemis yeah. that integrates with open rgb and lets you do it does all the game integration stuff um so if you want like your uh overwatch character colors to show up when you switch from diva to the hamster guy on your keyboard and also all the lights in your computer you can do that the hamster guy what's that do you remember his name doesn't he deserve a little more respect what's, what's his name brad i don't know Oh, I'm, see? I'm not the one who called him the hamster guy. Look, he's the hamster guy. Uh, uh, have to have some respect for the hamster guy, please. Look, his name is Hamtaro, I believe. OK, there you go. I, I, that's not right. Wait, isn't that an anime character? Right. That's a, okay. that's it. That's a, yeah, I've animated us. We have to move on. Can open RPG RGB do anything for the RGB when the machine is off? Because it turns out that this motherboard has a screen on it. The, uh, that I, I have disabled when the computer is on because I don't have a window in my PC, but that screen comes back on when the machine is off. So your motherboard BIOS has a stealth setting for RGB inside it. And if you put it in the stealth mode, when you when your computer goes to sleep, it turns off all the lights on the motherboard, okay. including when that screen, probably when it's asleep or when it's off off, because I'm talking about completely shut down. It did. I believe it works for both of those. Okay. okay. This, this is also this? I can't. I can't I can't believe what is happening to computer part branding. Let me see if I got this straight. I believe this is an Asus board. It is an ROG Maximus Z790 Dark Hero. Is that the Evangel an Evangelion board? No. Wait, With do they the have typos? one? They have they one. Have, they had to recall it because it had a typo. Oh, no. Yeah, whoops. Like on the board? Like printed That's on my, the board? Printed on the board is my can't understanding, have yes. Can't no. have that. Look, some brand sanctity, please. Uh, um, anyway, this this thing... It's the side of the IO shield, you know, where all the ports are, the big, the big block that has all the USB ports and stuff in it. Oh, yeah, side, yeah. The side of that block that faces out is a screen. You can That's customize, amazing. You can customize what is displayed on that screen. So good. Uh, and I, I don't, I mean, whatever, I'm sure it's using next to zero power, but having it run all the time when the machine's off seems I just, excessive. I just don't want lights coming on my computer. I want, yeah. I want to look at the computer and see the lights on when it's on and the lights off when it's off. And I think I, sometimes I feel like I'm the last person on earth who doesn't have a window on their PC. You should get a window and your windows uh, are cool, man. I have windows on two or three sides of my PC. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know why my particular fetish is not seeing technology, but I just, there's something, there's something, there's nothing more magical to me than using technology. I cannot see. Okay, I, I can respect that, but I'm also like if the, if, I, if the computer could physically not be in this room, I would absolutely do that. My computer looks like the Northern Lights when the lights are on. Well, so, you know, I guess there's some appeal there. Yeah. Um, can we talk? Can we talk about uh, low latency wireless headsets with sure. analog ins? Sure. Because I did a lot of research, probably just after we did this episode last year. Uh, to, I, I wanted a wireless headset because I spend a lot of time with headphones on and also I have a kid and stuff to do and I get up and walk into the kitchen and I yanked the cables out of my my uh, my uh, headphone amp many, many times over the years. So I wanted a wireless one, but I also like to have voice monitor on. So I need really low latency so I don't have weird reverb between what I'm hearing through my bone conduction in my skull and what comes back on the headphones. Turns out. There's some DJ headphones that are wireless that do that, that cost a whole lot of money. And mm -hmm. then Steel Series makes the Arctis Pro Wireless, which is also a really expensive headset, but is way less expensive than the DJ headsets. Uh, it was like, I got it for like 299 bucks, I think. Sounds it has, so bad. Uh, it's it's well, a lot for a gaming headset is the way I, like, if you're talking about studio monitors, like good headphones, I'm like, eh, it's not too bad, but. Well, I, I, I figure the wireless and especially the low latency adds 
a good, I don't know how much third of that or something. It has its own, it has a box that sits on the desk with a USB cable. Yes. So it's bus, it's USB powered. I just plug it into one of those Anker power strips actually, uh, and then run the line out from my headphone amp into, into that. Um, and it works remarkably well. It has two batteries. So there's one battery that's, that stays in the headset all the time. There's a spare that's charging. You can swap it out as long as you can do that in less than eight seconds. Then it like drops for a second and then immediately reconnects. You know, you have to hit the power button. Uh, when I have used the microphone with it, it's a pretty good microphone for a gaming headset, which I would expect for a $300 headset. Um, but yeah, uh, generally, generally quite good. If I didn't have the desire to hear my own voice back in my ears for monitoring purposes, I probably would have bought something much cheaper. Yeah. But here we are. This is, this is going to be another one of those things that people who don't record on themselves for a living don't care about, but I have basically trained myself to not have a monitor anymore. Due to, I, I, due to some complexities in my wiring setup and like, it's just getting, getting sound out of my audio interface to get my voice back into the mix that I'm doing currently is just too much of a pain in the ass. And these headphones, these a forties are just, kind of open enough in the ear cups that I can at least basically hear myself through the bones in my ears. So the problem I have is that if I don't have a pretty good monitor, then I just get louder and louder and louder until I can't hear myself until I blow out my voice basically. So interesting. Yeah. Uh, I mean, to be fair or to be clear, rather, if you record a podcast or anything else, you should be able to hear yourself, but I, I'm working around it. Well, I, I also play games, especially when I was playing PUBG and sound was such an important part of that game. I probably was keeping the game volume too loud. So I, I was, I was, uh, had to boost the voice in the headset to accommodate that. Yeah. Speaking of speaking of wireless headphones, I, I can't believe I'm saying this. I'm at least moderately thankful for Bluetooth audio. I've had like a decent amount of okay experiences with Bluetooth audio this year. What, what what Bluetooth audio devices are you using? Um, I've got all kinds of stuff now. Um, and I'm trying to remember, I can't actually remember the brand of a couple of them because they were sent to me for review. Oh, um, uh, the Odyssey Mobius, I think is the kind of over ear headphone head, headset I've got. That's Bluetooth okay. that I occasionally use in, in the, in the office like, here, like with the PlayStation or something or uh, most with the PC. If okay. just, if I need to be listening to something and moving around. Um, gotcha. I, I mean, I've, I've got a couple of like, lower cost uh, wireless earbuds for exercise and stuff like that. Like they all just kind of work like um, God, I think, I think Anker puts their brand on these. They are sound cores. Yeah. Sound those core. are, those are those, they, they're, they're the follow up to the liberties. I think yes, and those were pretty yeah. good. I can't remember which model I got. They were like less than 30 bucks though. And they're like shockingly good quality and like the nice little charging case. Like it just, Cheap, good Bluetooth headphones are everywhere now, and they are quite, quite acceptable in performance. I, um, um, I, I have on my list the AirPod Pro 2s, which are not cheap, but are very good um, for people who live in the Apple ecosystem like the ability to switch between devices. Like when I'm, when I pick up my iPad after I've been listening to something on my phone or on the TV or whatever, and it just switches to the iPad automatically. And then I lay down in bed, I put the, something on the TV and I can listen to the TV and or in the living room without bothering everybody else in the room. It's really, really nice. Um, and the new adaptive transparency mode thing that they rolled out that so before you had transparency mode, which let you hear what was going on in the world around you without any of the, it, it was, it was freaky because it didn't normally when you have in your monitors, the world sounds muted, even if you have a transparency mode and this, it just sounded like there was no filtering or anything. It just sounded like you hear through your ears. Um, and then the noise canceling, which is everybody knows what noise canceling is. This does a little bit of both. So you get like background noise, but they filter out the things that annoy you like fan noise and, and like cooking noises and stuff like that. But you can hear voices and you can hear cars. So like if you're out walking around, you're out jogging, you're taking the dog for a walk or something, you can have that on and not worry about somebody sneaking up behind you and stabbing you or getting hit by a car when you cross the street because you don't hear it coming. Uh, it's pretty good. And then they, they, they automatically, when you start talking, they mute and pause whatever you're listening to if you choose to turn that on. So that like if you're listening to a podcast and then your partner comes in and starts talking to you, you can respond and not not have to like fiddle with your phone before you talk to them. It's the relationship saver. It's 
I, I'm going to tell you, I turned it on on my wife's phone without telling her. And it's fabulous because it means that like when she's listening to something, I can talk, have a conversation without her being distracted and not hearing me. Yes. We, we also have that experience around here. It's a thing. Yeah. If, if, if one, if, if at least one person in the relationship likes to wear earbuds around the house to do stuff. Yep. It can hamper communication. I mean, look, say. I love when I'm doing like cleaning or cooking or something. I love putting on a podcast and just listening. Oh, I just got, I just got a gesture from the door. Is it rude or oh. loving? Okay, oh. good. It was, it was more defiant. Let's say. Yeah. I, look, I, I think is the, <laughs> it's the word I would use. I'm never going to complain about somebody listening to a podcast while they oh, do something else. No, absolutely not. Um, I did, since we're talking about all this Bluetooth audio stuff, I swear one day we will do our Bluetooth trilogy. Oh, the Bluetooth of, triptych of, of episodes. Yes. Yeah. Our, our, our magnum opus. I'm going to go and tell you reading and learning about Bluetooth at night as I'm getting ready to go to bed mm -hmm. has turned out to be the best sleep aid I've ever had because I've read oh, most of the Bluetooth of, one spec. Oh my God. I never thought about that. Maybe I should just like get some spec sheets on my iPad and like read or RFCs. Uh -oh. Maybe yeah. I should just go download a bunch of RFCs and try to read those as I fall asleep. The, the, it, you will, if you last more than 15 minutes, you're doing great. That's my, uh, I, I'm, I'm of new appreciation for the people who do that stuff uh, for a living at, at, at the big tech companies. You know what? I didn't need plan to come in here and talk about this. The, the Kindle that I bought last year, I yeah. extremely like, Part of this is a lifestyle thing. Like I bought it and proceeded to kind of not use it as I have the last two Kindles I've had. Yeah. Something changed like three, four months ago where I it's like a sleep hygiene thing, honestly. Like I've had a lot of sleep problems the last few years. And one of the things I was trying to alleviate that was not bringing the iPad to bed anymore. Mm. Um, and so I started reading books on the Kindle before bed instead. And it has, I, I can't say there's a direct causation there, but it sure seems to have helped. Anyway, the reflective screen is better than the transmissive screen. Science, yeah. you heard it here first. Yeah, yeah who would have thought? Um, the thing's got dark mode in it. I can't, it's, I think it's just the newest paper white. There's nothing fancy about it. It's like the baseline $100 model. Yeah. Um, the dark mode is very nice to have at night, especially if, if you have a partner who tries to go to sleep earlier than you. Like that also helps not just for your kind of, you know, not absorbing too much light as you're reading, but also for somebody else who's trying to sleep there. Not eye blasting um, your, your bedmates is always appreciated. Yeah. Like it's, it's the third Kindle I've had and it's the first one I've had where I'm like, okay, this feels like it's where it needs to be. Like I, if I never got another Kindle for the rest of my life, I'd probably be fine with this. Like, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm in the same boat. I got the same one. I got it at the same time you got yours and it's, it's been, it's been quite good. Like the backlights I, used to be a mess. Like the, all the ones I had before, like real, I mean, not that it, you, you can still read it, but it just looks kind of ugly, like kind of uneven. So like they un fixed, they fixed that a few years ago, okay. but, but they, they, the problem I always had was that they couldn't quite get dim enough. Like the, the, the gradation and brightnesses at the very low end wasn't, wasn't like the jump from not on enough to read to on to read was too much. Yes. And you couldn't get to like the, I want to ride the line of what my eyes yes. are able to make out at late at night. Yeah, for so. sure. That's actually, ironically, that's a problem I have with the iPad at night, but, uh, but the Kindle gets very dark and the dark mode also helps. Um, it's yeah. just, it's just, it's just nice. Um, last thing I was gonna say about headphones real quick with all this talk of wireless audio in the living room, I'm now going the exact opposite direction. But do you have a big chonky I, quarter I just, inch cable into your receiver? I just ordered a big chonky quarter inch cable to put in my receiver. For which headphones? Um, I use A40s in there too. Oh, I have okay. two pairs of them. Uh, I'm just tired of fighting with wireless audio in the living room. I wish you'd said something. I think I have one of those just sitting here aging. Oh, the cable? Yeah. Um, I actually, so I'm replacing one that is a Radio Shack brand cable that I've had since college. Okay. Well that I can't help with. Uh, it still works actually. Is the connection is a little, it's the connection is just finicky enough. Oh. You have to jiggle the connector a little too much. Is it like a quarter inch to three eighths or, or, or one eighth or whatever it is? It's, um, it is female to male three and a half millimeter on Got both it. ends. Okay. So I was using an adapter, but I just, I have whatever. I just bought a replacement. Yeah. Um, that's cool. But well, it's nice for the Switch because I, I think there are still no really good options for wireless Switch audio, right? Like you can the do Series wireless X. Bluetooth on the Switch now, but it's up. It's iffy is my understanding. Yeah, like I haven't latency, ever actually tried it. I think the latency is still an issue from what I understand. I don't think that. I think that the reason they didn't flip that on at first is because they didn't have the right codecs on the Bluetooth codec that they used. And yeah. Um, you know, Series X and PS5, you can just plug headphones straight into the controller. I have had, do you ever use the wireless audio in the Xbox controller? Because I have had the worst luck with it since they introduced that into the controllers. 
I have used it. I used it more with the PS4 generation than so I have with the PS5. PS4 and PS5 controller audio, headphone audio work beautifully for me. I've never had any problems, but the yeah. Xbox audio, since they put a headphone jack into Xbox One controllers, how like eight Instead years ago. Instead of that weird dongle that they used to have. Yeah. It is, so, it, I get I get constant dropouts, constant crackling. I have huh. no idea what it is in that in that room. I um, used it on the Xbox, but probably on the, only on the Wi-Fi Direct controllers and not on the Bluetooth controllers. Would be my guess. Interesting, because they remember the first controllers that they released were Wi-Fi Direct, and then when they rolled out yes. the ones with the Plus Pad, yes. I think that was when it became Bluetooth. When the Xbox One S came out, yeah, that sounds right. Um, um, but I only ever I I think I only have one of the Bluetooth controllers. It's not an Xbox Series controller. Um, we still have the Roku hooked up there. And the only reason I have that is because the Roku remote has a headphone jack in it, but I've been getting the same dropouts with that lately. So I don't know if there's just some kind of insanely gnarly interference in this apartment building. So this is where, this is where I use the AirPod pro headphones to just connect to the Apple TV and everything works. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you want to talk about, can we talk about coffee for, or do you want to talk about steam deck? I'll give, choose your own adventure here, Brad. Uh, I don't know. You just look, you, I, uh, Steam Deck. Okay, Steam Deck, Steam Deck OLED issues aside, uh, that are shipping issues aside, I am uh, the Steam Deck is something I use not quite every day, but multiple times a week, and I can sit and play PC games in the living room while we're while we're doing, you know, whether it's hanging out and watching something or just everybody sitting in the living room doing their own thing, but we're doing it in the same room at least. It's been really nice, um, and I I am kind of in awe of that thing just in general. Like there's, there, there is such a handheld craze going on for the last, pretty much since the switch launched, I guess the switch yeah. is what ushered it in. And now there's 10 bajillion X86 handhelds, not just the steam deck, but the IA Neo and the uh-huh. ROG ally. And like, there's other stuff I'm not even thinking of. Like it just, man, the world loves handhelds. And I, mean, I always, sh- I always have to remind myself that screen contention is what one reason for that. The, if you live in a house with like one big TV and multiple people who want to use it for different things. Yeah. I mean, that's why I use it is because I can play games in the living room without having to say, no, you can't watch something on TV to my daughter or wife. Like like my girlfriend just watches so little TV. She's just not that interested in in TV or if it's a movie, we're generally watching it together. So I just never even have to think about the TV being in use. Well, Um, it's, but it's also like, I can play a game on the Steam Deck, even if it's streamed from the PC or something that I would never want my daughter to see on the big screen. Sure. Right. Okay. So I like think about that. Yeah. Yeah. Like there's there's a, a fairly large number of PC games that I play on the reg that I wouldn't want a 10 year old to see. Uh, you know, and that that'll stop being as much of an issue in the next few years. Mm-hmm. But for now, it's a it's a primary consideration. So fair, fair, uh, quite like it. And and like the. The other side of it is that I'm using it for like I played most of uh, Link, Link to the Past on it last year. Right. It's like I've set up the MU deck stuff and played a bunch of old games and they run wonderfully. And I find myself if it's if it's a big triple A game, I often stream it from the PC in the living room in the other room. Um but like a lot of indie stuff like Dave the Diver and Dredge and a bunch of stuff that I played this year. I just played native on the deck and it runs great. and The battery lasts a long time and it's quite good. You played most of Link to the Past. I, Brad, that sixth dungeon I'm bad at. Is that the ice dungeon? The, the ice dungeon, the boss at the end I, is just an absolute bastard. I've dude, only beaten it like three times in my I don't life. Even know, I'm not. I'm not sure that I have played Link to the Past start to finish more than once. I may have. Uh, no, that's. I, I was. I did. I did replay games back then. I guess I probably played it at least a couple of times through, but I have not beaten that game since the '90s, and I still knew that it was the ice dungeon. <laughs> Yeah, the Ice Dungeon. When it came out on the GBA, I couldn't beat it on the GBA because my hands were too big for the for the for the GBA SP. Um, I yeah, it's it's that one's a real real hard one. Mm -hmm. And the D pad on the on the Steam Deck is not maybe the best for uh, that kind of game. It's okay. Room for improvement. Yeah. Um, Coffee. You were going to say. You want to do coffee? You want to talk about the next level pulsar? We talked about this a couple of weeks ago, a little bit, but it is zero bypass brewing. I am officially a convert after using this thing for. Cool. uh, Let's see. I got a hundred filters, and I have about thirty-five left. So, figure seventy days. Mm -hmm. Um, I I am. I am uh, with the help some from from some 
uh, with the help of some folks from the Discord and reading uh, Jonathan Gogne and Scott R Rao and um, the ne Next Level blog about how to do it. I've had some really incredible cups of coffee. I'm still not like still not as consistent as I was with a pour over, but I'm getting there. Great. And uh, it's a it's a it's a truly the, the idea is the reason it's called a zero bypass is because it's designed so that there's no way for the water to bypass the coffee as it passes through the filter and goes into the, into the cup underneath. Um, and, and the neat thing about the pulsar pulsar is that it has a valve that lets you open and close. So you're not just the, the flow speed of the coffee is not entirely dependent on the grind size and the filter that you choose to use. You also have some manual control over that, which is novel. That's so, cool. That's it's cool. really good. Uh, they're more widely available. It seems like they're dropping new batches. Uh, somebody posted in the Discord that they were able to get one. You just kind of keep an eye on the site, and oh, this you get is in, a this is a limited the, stock situation. I think they're making them as fast as they selling them as fast as they can make them right now. Yeah. So it's like every week or two they drop a new batch, and they 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 are lasting longer each time. So, real quick, speaking of coffee, I uh, I haven't done it yet, but I am I am going to order a nut milk bag. Oh, at some point. Very good to test out the filtration. Get, getting a nylon one, I guess. Properties, yeah, I'll get the nylon yeah. one. Yeah, that seems good. Yeah, uh, the, the nut milk bag material is what my Hario filter uses. So, okay. Oh, you have one. I have a Hario cold brew maker that uses the that same kind of nylon oh, that, that's in a nut of, milk bag. Yeah, type of material. Okay. Yeah, I'm excited. What um, else you got? Anything else? I can't believe I I wrote down I wrote down YouTube. Yes, really. Here. Oh, wow. Like, I don't know if, I don't know. If How do you YouTube... feel about the letter Q, Brad? Mm, look, it ha okay. It's a platform with some downsides. What, what, what's, what, what's your favorite, uh, hydration beverage brought to you by, do you know, you probably don't know about prime because you don't have kids. No. Uh, prime is a Gatorade style hydration beverage that is brought to you by all of your favorite YouTubers, including one of the Paul brothers and oh, good. Yeah, it's a Mr. Beast, and there's a whole bunch of kind of awful to just a generally annoying people on that list. I'm going to assume it's the bad Paul. I think they're both bad Pauls. But yeah, I think one I think is one way is, worse. Yeah, it's not. It's not the. It's not Jake. It's the other one. I don't even remember his name. I think Logan, Logan is the WWE current WWE champion. Yeah, I think I th that's I think, the one that did the beverage. Oh, I think he's less bad. I could be wrong. I saw Mark Rober doing some prime stuff the other day i was a little bummed about that but mark rober's still okay in my book yeah yeah well okay look youtube has got its problems yeah for sure i feel like it I, either i'm just using more of it or it got better at some point though i just feel like there is such a range of stuff on there now it's even when it was terrible there was still an incredible like if you want to find out how to do something that somebody has to show you there's probably a video of it yeah Yes, absolutely. I like yeah. for tutorial purposes, for like historical purposes. I mean, in, in, in multiple ways, like I think we talked about like finding old episodes of old, old broadcasts of Nightline and stuff like that on there from like mm -hmm. world historical events. Um, but also like, you know, the and I think you have to be careful here, but the little cottage industry of like people making their own documentaries is like really thriving. But where you have to be careful is like make sure the information sources are good and, you know, Look, man, I have a lot of questions about chemtrails, I think, is, is right. the only thing to right. know. Like, just because it's cut together and narrated professionally doesn't necessarily mean it's authoritative. But like, no. for example, the history of next computer that I found, I feel fairly confident is like reasonably sound. I think that seems that seems like an OK category. Uh, I, I love and like, and, and that would never get made by like a production company with funding. You know what I mean? Like somebody like a YouTuber made that and did the research and like it was like reasonably high quality and like. I learned a lot of fascinating stuff about next computer that I love to hear. Well, like, there's just so much cool stuff like that. It's like the stuff that Danny does, right? Yes. Yes. Um, like the game documentaries and music documentaries. And there's a bunch of cool stuff surrounding the arts. I, I also like as a homeowner who likes to figure out how to fix things myself, I absolutely love like the plumbers that post, Hey, here's the right way to use a toilet snake. Uh, or here's, here's how it's always plumbing stuff for me, but here's how to you know, snake your, 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 uh, tub and, and all that kind of stuff. Like it's incredibly yeah. useful. Years, years and years ago, I learned to tie a Windsor knot from YouTube in five there minutes, you, you know, like double I, Windsor or single Windsor, uh, just a single, just I'm a single, not that fancy. Can you no. even tell the difference once it's tied? Like, is it the visible? Single is symmetrical. The double is symmetrical and the single is a little lopsided. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Well, 
nobody noticed. I, I didn't, we didn't judge. I got it. I got it in one at the wedding I went to a couple of weeks ago. Like nice. first time, first time I tied it, like length, correct, everything. I was very proud. See, I had enough jobs that I got really good at, that I had to wear a tie at, that I got good at tying a tie and I do it twice a year if, a, if it's yeah. a bad year these days. Yeah. Anyway, I, it's, I think it's possible to carve out a nice existence on YouTube these days in terms of the stuff that you're, that you're getting recommended. I, yeah, like it's funny. My YouTube is, is like cute cats and dogs because I watch it a lot with my daughter and like roller coaster POVs because we watch roller coaster videos together. And then like people making stuff that's cool. So it's, I, I can't complain. You, you know what I've got a ton of since, since I got the new TV HDR demos. I bet. So, so yes, I, I, I search for HDR demos, but a lot of what comes up are these just like wordless city walkthrough videos. Oh, I love that. Somebody's just got like an HDR 4k camera on some kind of steady cam thing. And then they're just 45 minutes of walking through a major city at night or whatever. That sounds pretty good. And so like, I've got one queued up right now from two days ago. Cause now I'm getting a served aid crap load of them you know it's like you know it's like hey chicago in a rainstorm or whatever like i've got one queued up that's uh Rapongi hills in tokyo like the, all the christmas decorations are up oh that sounds good from literally like two days ago it's a 4k hdr it's like demo but also it's just <laughs> if you just want to sit there and zone out and watch somebody walk around in a city it's pretty awesome that sounds fabulous yes so uh the Okay, last thing for me, I got a new iPad last year. It's the first new iPad I've had since like the second air probably. So it's been a minute. I it, I didn't really, I found I was using the laptop instead of the iPad. Um, really? Yeah, because I did. I wasn't doing like pencil-y stuff. I wasn't doing anything that required drawing and I switched to big phone. So I was using the big phone for stuff. But the iPad I've really enjoyed having because I can read like I subscribed to Marvel Unlimited for like 30 bucks and read a bazillion old Marvel comics and uh, uh, have been doing a lot, kind of a lot of like I got Procreate and a couple other things um, and have started doing a lot of drawing on the iPad and like I'll do sketching. I do uh, storyboarding for stuff that we're doing at work. My daughter takes it and does like all sorts of cool flat drawing. It's it's been um it's it's been surprisingly good and i i realized i've been using it because i had to buy new tips for the pencil in like june of this year so in six months we burned through one tip and i've i'm i just pulled the last one out of the out of the thing she draws a lot and i also it's also worth mentioning i put one of those paper um paper texture screen protectors on the ipad so they wear it a little bit faster because it's a little it is it's got a little bit of a of a i don't know how to describe it but it's, it's just like a little bit of a it's got a paper texture kind on like it a mat, basically a mat kind of texture yeah it's, it, when you're when you're rubbing the paper on the pencil on it it feels like you're actually writing on paper I don't think I ever considered that the tips on the Apple pencil would wear out. Yeah, they're they're soft. They're soft enough plastic that um, that they just they the thing that happens is that you get a flat side and a and a um, oh sure and a not flat side yeah. and it's not it's not super apparent. But I don't want to damage the screen, so I and the tips the replacement tips are like two dollars each or something. You get a three pack for eight bucks, I think, or six bucks. So um, they're not. It's, it is, it is a relatively low cost of entry and that the pencil, the, the pencil is another one of those things. This is the, the, the iPad I have uses the version two pencil, not the version one pencil. It's, it's kind of remarkable how well that thing works. That's cool. Yeah. Cause it seems, it seems like it would be very gimmicky. Like, I mean, I, you know, Apple's good at this, but like to hear that they have developed it into something that is actually like extremely useful and, and possibly even critical to somebody's workflow. It's it's so there's two things. The 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 drawing tool that I use is really, really good. And it does both pressure sensitivity and angle sensitivity. So you can do like really thin. You can do like crazy thin lines if you want. But you can also apply some pressure and vary your thicknesses and stuff like that. And it, it models everything from like paint markers and and Sharpies all the way down to brushes and stuff like that. I mostly use pencils and 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 like uh, fountain pen type ink. Uh, and then their free form thing is really good for when I need to sketch something out for like a flow in, in, uh, in, in the game or something like that. So like I did storyboards the other day and that was all in that. I wonder if, I wonder if working out like the, the physics characteristics of those different brush and pencil and pen types was an interesting problem for whoever worked on that. Like having to, having to model the, like the pressure and the angle and, and surface contact and stuff like that. Well, so the neat thing is in Procreate, at least, like there's a whole like cottage industry of people who build 
uh, build tools for that. Oh, wow. That's cool. Um, they like you can you can sell your brushes on the marketplace and i mean it's the normal thing with like any kind of creator economy but they actually they actually have people come on that are like yeah i do this brush and this brush and this brush and this. like i didn't never in a million years thought that this would be my job but now i make brushes for procreate for a living uh, and they're actually just rolling out their 2d animation thing i think like next month that goes along with uh, procreate so that's cool pretty stoked like procreate procreate's a remarkable piece of software i i i, I quite like it quite a name as well i mean they look it a good name goes a long way <laughs> sure uh all right my last thing here uh I'm, I'm going to call this body tech i guess okay yeah uh intermittent fasting Oh, this is, I see the ads for this on TikTok all the time. Yeah. You, uh, you get an app and then some muscly guy yells at you some. And the next thing you know, uh, like you're ripped, right? You don't need an app for this. Do not pay okay. money for, you can just go read a web page or two and you're good. Oh, so what's the, what's the gist? Uh, the gist is don't eat. Okay. What do you think? <laughs> I like eating bread. This seems like a bad thing for me. So do I, but it turned out when I did less of it, I felt way better. Oh, interesting. Uh, and and also had more mental clarity and energy yeah. as well, which How, seems paradoxical. Do you get the meat sweats often now or not so much? No. You mean when I do eat meat? Yeah, or when you I, do eat. No, no, not really. No, okay. I just generally feel a lot healthier than I did. That's nice. Well, I won't get into it, but I was, look, I'm in my mid 40s now. These things happen. Your lifestyle catches up to you at some point. That's true. Word word of warning to anybody who's younger than us. I didn't have anything like explicitly dire going on, but some things were like, you know, maybe I should live a little healthier. Yeah. And so, yeah, I started in like May. Okay. I actually just weighed myself this morning. I have lost 40 pounds since May. Damn, dude. Nice. That's awesome. It's, it, was, it was like shocking. How, how how well it has worked. So so what's what's the like you just only eat certain in certain time periods? Is it's that like how it works? Super kind of however you want to do it. There's all sorts of different ways people do it. Um, I, I think the most common is to just like pick a window every day, and that's the window you eat in. So like, I'm, I'm eating in about an eight hour window every day. Okay, roughly it, it's variable. I'm not like super strict about it. Let's say from like a one p.m. to a nine p.m. is about where I'm at right now. Oh, that seems reasonable. Yeah, it's super reasonable. Um, my, I, it's weird. Do you um, eat three meals inside that window? No, still or just so like a, this has been like a weird kind of wake up call for a lot of things about our our modern society. Is like maybe three squares a day is not actually necessary for sedentary people, especially. Well, I mean, you you go out on walks and stuff, right? Yeah, you're not lethargic. I've also been getting more exercise this year. Like since yeah. I started fasting, I also started making a conscious effort to do more weightlifting and walking and stuff. But like. I mean, I think back to, I think back to growing up, you know, and it's like the, you know, the biscuits and gravy in the morning and like, yeah, the old timers called that like a, like a stick to your ribs breakfast. Cause like the idea was you ate that and then you went and worked in the sawmill all day or in, or worked out in the field all day. Yeah. For some sort of physical labor. Yeah. So any, anyway, whatever, like you could, if you just Google intermittent fasting, a bunch of links will come up. I like, I get the skepticism because there's a bunch of shitty apps being advertised like on Twitter and stuff for this, but like, it's like Johns Hopkins and Harvard health. Harvard Medical and Mayo Clinic are like the first things you'll find. And it's like, you know, it's it's working scientists and, and health and medical researchers who are speaking on this stuff. Well, the, the the first time I saw anything about intermittent fasting, I don't mean this as a, as a dig, but was when uh, what's his name? Uh, Peter Thiel was that was one of the things that he cited as part of his life uh, life extending plan was the the research that the people who do intermittent fasting tend to have longer lifespans with better outcomes toward the end of life yes peter thiel is a nightmare but yeah he's not you know he could read a study like anybody else just because it's popular with tech bros doesn't mean it's yes. uh, to be discounted i guess that's kind of exactly uh that's exactly where i'm at i mean whatever you know no, no research is definitive uh anyway i just I, I feel better and have clearly it has been effective at weight loss are you finding that you like are s just starving at one o'clock when you when you're when the clock ticks over not or anymore is it, like the really? first I'd, i would say like if you try to do this the first two weeks are pretty rough yeah. Like the first two weeks are definitely some like, oh, my God, I cannot make it till two o'clock. I'm going to die. I'm going to claw my way there kind of thing. Are you still drinking coffee in the morning? Yeah, or is so it like do you, liquids are fine, right? I do. I do drink black coffee. So okay. like anything that's not um, I haven't even gotten into the actual I don't know that I could do a, a good job of explaining this. But like the idea is that the I believe it's the insulin in your blood is dropping basically like the, the things that 
yeah. the things that the things that tell your body to use the sugar in your bloodstream, those hormones go down because there's no more sugar in your bloodstream, right? Like after so many hours, and that's when that's when you start using your fat stores for energy instead of instead of the blood circulating as blood sugar. It's fascinating. Um, yeah. So anyway, like the the schedules are like like I said, I don't eat in the morning, and I just basically eat kind of early, late, mid afternoon until sometime before bed. And are you just eating normal stuff in the like, yeah. like normal, the normal stuff you always would? There's like all kinds of different plans you can go look at. Some of them literally say like, hey, eat anything you want but for six hours a day or something like that. Like it's yeah. one way, one way people do it. So like, like a, a, um, a six and 18 is what a lot of people do, okay. which is a little hardcore for me. I do more of like an eight and 16. Some people do like an every other day thing. Like some people like eat one day and not the next, which I don't think I could ever handle. That's that's a kind of an extreme one for me. Yeah, that seems like that's that that much variation seems bad. But yeah, like, I, I could but not, like I could limiting not it to six that. or eight hours seems seems like, yeah, seems manageable. It's crazy how much you change over the course of like, say, a month of doing this, because like I'll not ha- I'll have not eaten some days. I'll have not eaten for like 16, 18 hours and I get to th- the point where I can eat and I'm just like, yeah, I guess I'll eat. Like <laughs> I don't even think if it's not, I'm not even thinking about it anymore. It's really, it's a weird mental physiological change. I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm peddling some kind of woo here, but <laughs> when you said you were doing this, this was my first, my first response was, Oh, Brad's into the woo. Now I worry that it comes off that way, but like, it really has like, I, I genuinely feel better. And again, like 40 pounds in six months feels pretty significant. And, and to be clear, I had a lot to lose. That's not going to be everyone's experience. Yeah. But six months is like 24 weeks. So that's two pounds a week, which is a reasonable amount of weight to lose. Right. Like yeah. you're, you, you, yeah, that makes sense. Huh. Well, I might, I might, I might get intermittent too. Um, I think that's it. I'd be curious when people post the, when people are reading this, uh, listening to the episode, I'd love to love for people in the discord to post the things that they're thankful for. Cause I'm sure that people have good stuff. Um, you can post it in the, in the thread, or if you're a, a non discord listener, you can just send us an email at techpod at content town. Maybe we'll pull out some of the good ones at the, uh, at the, at the Q and a episode at the end of the month. Yeah. Um, but it's all, uh, and, and Brad, as always, I'm thankful for you. Well, thank you. Same to you. Uh, I enjoy our weekly chats are, mm-hmm. are always, uh, always a highlight uh, of the end of my week. So yeah, same to you. I'm also thankful for our patrons. Yes, absolutely. Without whom we would not be here. Without the patrons, yeah, we this is a listener supported show, and we would not be here without uh, the wonderful p- folks who who fund us and keep us going. Uh, as always, you can go to Patreon.com/slash/TechPod and find out more about how to support the show for as little as five bucks a month. You get access to uh, the fabulous TechPod Discord, full of beautiful nerds that probably like a lot of the same things you do, or maybe not. Maybe you like something that no one there likes, and we could make a new channel just for you and the people that you convert to your way of life. Um, uh, you also get the patron exclusive episode, which we do every month and is sometimes a continuation of something we talked about in the in the regular episode. Sometimes it's more Q's and A's. Sometimes it's just something completely off the wall. And we just like we're deep in projects we want to talk through while we're figuring out what what will become an episode and what won't. So uh, people seem to like it is yeah. what I will say. Yeah. Uh, but as always, thank you to all of our patrons. But a very special thank you to our executive producer to your patrons, including Nick Johnston. Paddle Creek Games Makers of Fractured Veil, Andrew Slosky, Jordan Lippett, Dollar Sign, Just Wedge, Joel Krauska, Twinkle Twinkie, David Allen, James Kamek, and Pantheon, makers of the HS3 High Speed 3D Printer. Thank you all so much. Yes, thank you. Thank you, thank you. And uh, I guess that'll do it for us this week. Yes, it will. I, I will say if anybody goes out, I mean, you'll see this if you go look up any fasting stuff, like talk to your doctor before you make any major dietary changes in case you're... What if I don't believe... What if, Look, what if I only believe in medicine that I read about on Twitter mm. and uh, I do my own research, Brad? I think, I think you'll be just fine then. Okay, that sounds great. Uh, thanks, everybody, for listening. We will see you all next week. And I hope everybody has, in the U.S. at least, has a lovely Thanksgiving. Bye.